I think since, I think 1995, if my memory serves correctly. Um, he's an author who's written two excellent books, both of which I've read and gotten a lot out of. And he's also a father of 11, so he's got a lot to share with us today. Um, we invited him back in the fall to come and speak, and he was going to come fly out here and be with us in person. Um, and then when this whole uh, shelter in place got published, we debated whether we wanted to reschedule him for next year or whether we wanted to stick with this virtual format. And we decided that it was um, important for all of us to have this time together. Um, if you're like me, my parenting has been more tested than ever before this, this um, last couple months. And so I know I'm looking for some good advice and some, uh, some fresh energy to help with my parenting. So I'm really excited about this. Um, before we get going, just a quick word on the format. So we're gonna have Michael speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll do a Q&A session with him. There is a chat feature uh, in Zoom. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, I'm gonna send a little note to everybody. Um, So you should have just seen a little um, bubble pop up with my chat. If you have questions or comments or commentary, um, throw them out there during the meeting. Uh, there's also a feature where you can have a private chat. So if you wanted to say hi to a friend you haven't seen in a while, you can, you can flag their name specifically and it will just go to them. Um, but please pose questions as we go because we'll, we'll pull from those questions from the Q&A. Um, also, I wanna note, if you're not familiar with Zoom, there is a way that you can, um, stop your video if you if you need to sneeze or get up and go chat with a kid you can use the um, stop stop video feature all right before we get started father joseph's going to be joining us a little bit late so i am going to lead us in a prayer and i will share my screen so you guys can all follow along at home give me just a moment father joseph suggested we pray pope francis's prayer for the family, which hopefully you can all see on my screen. Oh, Brian's, I'm looking at you. Can you, can you do a thumbs up if you can see Pope Francis's prayer for family? All right, good. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, in you we contemplate the splendor of true love. To you we turn with trust. Holy family of Nazareth, grant that our families too may be places of communion and prayer, authentic schools of the gospel, and small domestic churches. Holy Family of Nazareth, may families never again experience violence, rejection, and division. May all who've been hurt or scandalized find ready comfort and healing. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, graciously hear our prayer. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michael. And Michael, I don't believe you need me to unmute me, but let me know if, if you need me to do that. Let's see. I know I have the power to do that. Hold on just one second. Okay. There we go. Great. Thank you, Nate. Um, well, it's good to be here. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. That would definitely be my preference as well. Um, but it is uh, good at least to be able to share some thoughts and hopefully have some dialogue um, about this very important topic of parenting. And a little bit about myself. Uh, thank you for the, the introduction. Nate, I was married to my wonderful wife, Angela, back in 1995. Um, we have 11 children, ages 3 to 22, uh, seven boys, four girls, and we live in Rockville, Maryland. My career has been as an educator. I've been working at the Heights since 1995, and the Heights is an amazing school in a lot of ways. It's a school that parents are primarily choosing because they're attracted by the mission of the school, a mission to help parents. It's an all boys school. So to help parents form their sons into the type of men who will be able to go out into the world and make a great positive impact 
that men that who will be in love with God, um, with a strong spirit of service, the type of men that you would very much want your daughters to marry. Um, I have written two books, one on fatherhood and one on parenting. And uh, let's see, what else about myself? I, I enjoy reading to my children. Um, we read in the evenings a lot of times before bed, depending on the, the age group. I'll have usually a few uh, with me. And right now I'm reading The Lord of the Rings to two of my little girls and one of my little boys. Um, we're in the Two Towers. It's a, a wonderful series. I enjoy camping, hiking, the outdoors. Um, family camping is something that uh, my wife and I can tell you that we both enjoy very much. And at the same time, we also somewhat dread. <laughs> it's very hard and challenging, but the adventure of it is, is also uh, very good and life-giving as well. Um, I always find it a bit awkward talking about parenting. There, there certainly are no perfect families. Uh, my experience at the Heights is I have seen some incredible families. I've seen families that I would call nothing short of heroic. Um, people who are really uh, coming close to that ideal that St. John Paul II mentioned of really being a communion of persons in, that fam in a family. But every family has its share of suffering. And as you get to know people, you recognize that there is not a family that has everything uh, perfect. And I certainly have made my own mistakes. I'm, I'm not perfect. If you ask my wife, she could definitely tell you that <laughs> I'm not perfect. Um, I'm thinking back to when my two oldest sons were very young. They were like about five or six years old and they were having a hard time getting up in the morning and going through their typical morning things, setting their bed, brushing their teeth, getting dressed, putting their stuff in order, getting ready for the day. And instead they would sort of lay in bed and laugh at each other and, and they were in bunk beds and uh, you know, just very, very slow moving. And so I said, well, Angela, I've got an idea here. And so what I did is I sort of turned it into a game. The first one to get ready in the morning and go through all his morning things, I would give him a high five and tell him he's the champion. I even had a little song that I would sing. And it, it worked. I mean, they, they were getting up and um, competing with each other to get ready. And my wife wasn't so sure. Angela was saying to me, you know, I'm not sure this is, exa is exactly what we need uh, what we need here. I'm not sure this is really them living the heroic minute well, you know, the heroic minute that getting up in the morning and kind of conquering ourselves right from the beginning of the day. Um, and I'm like, well, yeah, Angela, it's not perfect, but, but look at them. They're, they're hustling in the morning. It's kind of good. It's, it's, so that continued for a couple of days. And then it was about 2 a.m. in the morning when the door to our bedroom slams open my second son, Thomas, jumps into the room. He's all dressed and he starts yelling, I win, I win, I win. Angela and I both groggily wake up and she turns to me and she says, this is entirely your fault. So um, I acknowledge the point and uh, uh, then had to tone that whole thing down. I, I remember talking with them that we're no longer going to do the little uh, high five and the little champion song. It's, it's we're just going to try to get ready in the morning well for the sake of, you know, getting ready well, not, not um, to, to win the game. Um, so, you know, my hope is in what I share I, I, that if, um, if you can benefit by hearing about my mistakes, that would, that would be wonderful. Um, so a family is meant to be a true communion of persons. And St. John Paul II in his uh, apostolic letter, Familiaris Consortio would say, families be what you are, be that true communion. It's a very rich phrase. I mean, emphasizing that in the family, there should be unity, charity, harmony. All these things should ideally be present. And that this true communion that these persons that make up the family live is based on a commitment to a mission, um, recognizing that this life for all of its joys and how wonderful it can be at time, 
at times is merely a journey that we're meant to help each other get through this life and ultimately make it to heaven and to bring as many people with us as, as we can. That the most important thing is not if a child achieves something sort of this goal, short of this goal, some type of, of success as some people would um, uh, view it. But the most important thing is that a child grows up to embrace his or her vocation, whatever it is. And that we have families that are full of, of, of joy and optimism, that we see the world as fundamentally good, as created by God. But yet we invite our children in to the, to the reality that there is a great battle taking on place in the world around us. And there really is this transcendent battle between good and evil that's going around. Um, it's, our, our world is more like the Lord of the Rings, as J.R.R. Tolkien portrays it, or as many other uh, epic tales um, portray these great adventures and quests. It's very much like this. Um, and that we are on the winning side. We are called to be saints. We're called to be close friends of God. And for the majority of people, this is to be lived out in this wonderful adventure of family life. And yet, it's easy to say this, but all of our families fall short of this ideal in one way or another. I would say in our culture in general, the family is something that is very much under attack. It is something that is struggling. The institution of the family is something that's struggling. Um, some common ways that people fall short of the ideal that St. John Paul II presents to us. I wanted to give sort of three common ways that people fall short of this ideal of what a family should be. The first is the family as sort of the launching pad. And these are those families where the parents are definitely mission oriented and the mission is to raise children who are gonna be incredibly successful, that they're gonna have great careers, they're gonna be prestigious, they're gonna have wealth and power. And for this end, they will value hard work. I mean, valuing a lot of, of good things. And there's nothing wrong with having children who are good hard workers, who will do their work exceptionally well, and will even through their professional work, make a real contribution to society and help many people. But we tell ourselves short if that is the highest goal, if that becomes what's at the heart of our family. And um, this reminds me a, a little bit of, of Aristotle's point in his Nicomachean Ethics that all people are created, uh, all people desire, just because of the way they are, they desire happiness. Uh, every person acts for happiness in one way or another. But people fall short because they don't know what happiness really is for a person. And Aristotle goes through and talks about these substitutes for happiness that, that people have. And he says that wealth and power and prestige are ultimately you know, valuable as far as they go, but they're not really happiness because they're obviously something that people have for something else. Um, so the launching pad family. The second sort of category of family that I wanted to mention, the second model, if you will, would be uh, f families that are centered around being consumers of entertainment. And this would be families that their primary way of living that togetherness, of, of living that communion is by enjoying fun things together, um, whether it's watching a family movie or uh, whatever that could, could be for that family, a certain vacation, a certain trip. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. We enjoy it in, in our family um, tremendously spending time together and doing things together. Uh, we just celebrated a birthday of one of ours and um, it's, it's, it's delightful uh, to do that. But if the only uh, thing that a family is living for is enjoying entertaining experiences together, that will be far short 
of the high union that we are called to uh, to have. Um, again, to reference Aristotle, Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics mentioned that most people uh, think that happiness is simply going to be come from pleasure, from pleasurable experiences. And Aristotle relates this actually to a life of servitude, to a life of slavery, when people don't fulfill the true meaning of being human, but rather settle just for that. He has one of the, the most poignant lines um, in uh, the Western literary tradition. He says, in no way is the utter servility of the masses more manifest than in their preference for a bovine existence, kind of relating the notion that if you're just seeking after entertainment and that's the level that you're living on, you're really living the life of a slave. And then the third model, if you will, of, of how families can fall short of living as true communion, of living that true communion of persons is the collective isolation model. And this, I think, is something new. I, I think in previous times, the hardships of life forced a certain amount of togetherness. Uh, even if it was just working together, children helping out, contributing to the family. Um, but today we have the real possibility of people being together, but yet completely isolated. And the image that comes to my mind is a room full of people who are physically together, but yet are all um, present to the different devices that they're carrying and, and looking at. And there is no real communion. Um, of persons at all, you know, a much more serious problem than, than the other two. So one way we can try to approach St. John Paul II's ideal mm -hmm. is to focus on living the virtues and helping our children to grow in virtue as well. Um, by virtue, I mean essentially a good habit, a strength of character something virtues can be both natural and supernatural. The ancients, um, especially Aristotle, Cicero, would talk about the virtues of prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice, recognizing that these perfections, in a sense, are what leads to a very noble human being. And Aristotle would say that there's even happiness associated with living a virtuous life. That's the highest happiness that Aristotle could uh, uh, imagine. We also know from our faith that we have these wonderful virtues of faith, hope, and charity that uh, penetrate the, the person and actually make those natural virtues even more transformed and more alive because grace is so much at work uh, transforming us. And so just a, a couple of virtues that could be lived in family life. Um, the first one I wanted to talk about was industriousness. And this is a difficult virtue today because there's a real sense in which modern comforts have made it less necessary for children to work. It almost takes creativity on the part of parents to find meaningful ways for children to contribute. I mean, yes, there are very simple things such as making your bed in the morning, um, but it takes um, almost some extra thought to think of other things other than simple household chores that, that children can do. And one thing we have in our home is a, is a wood stove that we'll use in the winter to help heat the house. And so very early on, we told our children that they could collect wood from the backyard and the, the, the little bit of forest that was immediately behind the backyard and stack it up in piles. And I would essentially pay them for it if they would do that. Like, we'll take a look at the pile and based on how big it is, you know, we'll give them um, some, some payment. And I remember Michael and Thomas, when they were very young, doing this. And they would, uh, I would be off at work and come home and they would immediately want to show me their pile and they would want to know exactly how much it was worth. You know, dad, you, do you think that one's worth 20 cents? That's a, that's a great pile. Don't you think dad? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's probably 20 cents. 
and you know you notice the economy here was a, a, a great economy when they were that that young that all got destroyed when my brother Matt uh, hired them to help him move some stuff and paid them a couple dollars and then all of a sudden the the home economy that I had established was was gone uh, at that point but they they would uh, really enjoy doing that to the point where I had to tell them I'm gonna look at your pile twice a week or something like that on a regular time not not every day you've got to be patient you've got to uh, you know build up that pile and then the set time that I'll, I'll look at it I'll come out and look at it and by giving them a, a little bit of money and telling them that they're doing a great job and contributing to the the family and that made them that made them happy. They even took some of the money that they earned and invested it in a little handsaw that helped them to be more productive in their gathering and and cutting of the of the wood. Um, since then, when they got a bit older, they naturally transitioned into a lawn business and did a lot of snow shoveling around the neighborhood. They would go around with a shirt and tie and they had business cards that they would pass out and soon they had more jobs than they, than they knew what to do with. Um, and that bit of industriousness that came from that was, was, was well worth it. Another virtue related to industriousness would be the virtue of being studious, uh, having that true virtue of study, engaging in the difficult task of study by avoiding distractions and concentrating and trying to get your work done. This is something that is challenging for all of us right now. I, I imagine that you are struggling with distance learning as we all are here, both on the side of teachers and on the side of, of helping our, our own children at home and such with the distance learning project. Uh, but traditionally, the chief vice that was opposed to living this virtue of studiousness is the vice of curiosity. It was um, thought that a curious person is somebody who cannot sustain his attention studying what he should study, but is so easily distracted by other things. His curiosity leads him to go off on a tangent, to pursue something else, and to lose that disciplined train of thought which leads to the type of mastery that ideally should be there. Now, it's interesting because I'm not so sure that's how curiosity is looked at today. In fact, I was filling out not too long ago a recommendation for a student of mine for college. And some of these college recommendations have forms. And on these forms, they ask you to rate these different qualities that the students possess. You know, is the student hardworking? Does he interact well with his peers? And one of the questions was, rate his curiosity. And they wanted a high number. They wanted me to say, yes, the student is very curious. And that would be a very good thing in the context of the way that form was presented. Um, and I sort of knew what they were, what they were um, asking for. They wanted to make sure that the student was interested in learning, had a certain wonder and engagement with reality. And these certainly are very, very good things. And um, I think the word curiosity has partly changed in meaning, perhaps, over the last hundred years. But also, I think there's something else going on here. I think that the chief enemy to living the virtue of study, to living an intellectual life, is not simply curiosity, but instead a new dull boredom in the face of reality. And I think this comes from entertainment overload. It, it's people who've been so fed with, with images and with experiences, a lot of times coming rapidly one after another, that they are bored. And the notion of sustaining attention on anything is not attractive to them. And the prospect of becoming curious would be a step in the right direction because then at least there's some engagement with reality. Um, so there, the, I think a lot of times virtues can be described as a golden mean between two extremes. Some virtues can be described that way, not, not all virtues. Charity, for example, is one that we always want to grow in more and more. It's not a mean between extremes. 
but that vice of being uh, mentally dull and lethargic and uninterested in things has always been there. But the chief vice in ages past was this curiosity of having too much interest in things. Whereas today, this new dull boredom in the face of reality has taken on the role of being the biggest intellectual problem that we face, such that curiosity by comparison seems very much in the right direction, much closer to having that true spirit of study. Um, now, how to foster this in our, in our own children and in our own families. One thing that we've found uh, some success with, um, varying amounts of success, it doesn't always work great, but it's having a daily quiet time. And that's what, that's what we call it. Just as we schedule the day, we'll put down on the family schedule that goes on the refrigerator an hour where we call it quiet time. And the children know that during that time they are allowed to read. If they're old enough to read, that's what's expected of them. If they're too young, they can look at picture books or draw or do something quiet. And it'll often take place right in the middle of the day. And what we've noticed is that um, the children, they have so much energy. So they'll be running around outside a lot. And, and believe me, in this, this, even this time of quarantine, they're just running around um, doing all kinds of crazy things outside. They, They've recently built another tree fort. Uh, they built a chicken coop, and we just got some some chickens, which the children are now out, you know, watching them. It's it's actually wonderful to see. But in the middle of the day, to have that disciplined time where they come in, slow down, spend that time reading, we've noticed that after that time is up, they almost enjoy that play even more because it added some type of balance into their life which was you know, just enriching to them, even if they wouldn't put it um, uh, there. Now, um, this leads also to the, the next virtue, which is the virtue of order. And order in living a schedule well. This is something that, again, it's, it's, it's made for this time. I mean, if there's, if there's any opportunity to live this time that we have right now well, it, it can happen through this virtue of order. To recognize that this time that we've been given, all the time that we've been given is this great treasure. And if we have a plan, if we have a schedule, we can help to use this time well. We always try to post that family schedule on the refrigerator and encourage the older children to make up their own daily plan with blocks of time. The saying that I like a lot is to fail to plan is to plan to fail. Okay, so another virtue, just to talk about uh, briefly, the, the, the virtue of faith, the virtue of really passing on faith and that trust in God and the belief in all of the truths that we've received from God being revealed um, by God, that he's wanted to share this knowledge about himself about why we're really here, what this whole life is about. Uh, as Nate was mentioning, parents are the primary educators. And that certainly does mean that we are the first educators. And we are the ones that the children will learn the faith from. They'll learn from our example, of course. But it can be very, it can be wonderful if there's actual opportunities to teach the, the faith to our children. This can be simply by saying family prayers together, whether in these times it's watching uh, a mass, perhaps a live streamed mass, and trying to pray that as a family, recognizing that in this incredible transcendent mystery of the holy sacrifice of the mass, we can participate with it in a very real way, even though we're not physically present in the exact same church where it's taking place. I mean, in every mass, we, in a sense, are, are right there on Calvary with our Lord. Um, so uh, praying, praying the family rosary together can be very good. One thing that has worked well in our family is the nightly time of reading. 
So uh, I mentioned that right now I'm reading the Lord of the Rings series to some of my children. What we'll typically read before we read the book of literature that they really want to read is we'll go over some type of quick lesson on the, the faith or um, maybe even read from a book uh, that tells about the life of a saint or something like that. And one of the things I've noticed among young children is they love, love to memorize things. So if it's even if it's something as simple as, as like the Ten Commandments, they will want to memorize that. Okay, Dad, you say it first, and then we'll say it after you. And then after a while, we want to say it by ourselves and show that we've memorized it. And we were doing this with the works of mercy a while ago. And one of my daughters, Lucy, was, you know, asking for her turn. Okay, let me recite the list. I want to recite the list. And so she's going through the, the works of mercy and comes to the end of the list. And she says very reverently, and to bury the living and the dead. And then everyone in the room just broke out in laughter. And then Lucy immediately realized what she did, how she conflated the, the two lists, the pray for the living and the, and the dead and bury the dead from the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And, and uh, it, it, was, it was really funny. So in any case, just with, with something that simple um, uh, in the evenings before a time of reading, it can be an opportunity to have a little lesson um, uh, and that can have a big impact on, on the children. Authentic freedom is necessary for true virtue. Um, and in this context, I'm thinking of, of this strange time that we're living through right now, uh, boredom. I think boredom is something that actually can be an ally to parents if we look at it in the right way. Uh, a little bit of, of almost like a phenomenological analysis of boredom. I mean, I mean, boredom is a mild form of suffering that opens up the possibility of using one's freedom to freely choose some good, some adventure. No one wants to stay bored for for too long. I mean, eventually that boredom is going to prod them to, to act. So one possible way that parents can respond to boredom is by saying something with a smile on their face. Oh, you're bored. That's great. I can't wait to see what you will do next. Now, if children are too annoying by complaining about being bored and stuff, sometimes it also can be good to give them some chores to do. Well, you know, here, you can help by doing this. Yes, no, I really want you to do that. You have to do that now. Um, I've even heard of some parents that have a chore jar that they, that they take complaints of boredom and have somebody pull out a chore. But just the sense that it is a big mistake if we as parents view our role as providing entertainment to sort of alleviate the boredom of our children. Boredom is not something that should be medicated away through entertainment, um, through screens, through things that stifle the personality and the integral development of that personality. Rather, it's very healthy if children um, go on different forms of projects, get, engage in projects and, and adventures and things like that. Now, in our family, we're you know, try to do the best we can with regards to the screens. And it's challenging with distance learning because there's a lot of very good and legitimate uses of the computer. And it's necessary. It's a necessary professional tool in the world that we live in today. But one thing we've said is that we want to make sure that we continue to treat it as a professional tool and not something where it's an entertainment source. And so we have told our children in our house, you know, the rule on video games is no video games. And I know other families who have limited video games and, and have done other prudent things. And, and that's, that's fine. I mean, I've seen other families take different ways, but that's, that's the way we've taken. We've taken a no video game uh, stance. So um, I remember my son, John Paul, a few years ago, he, and couldn't play video games, but he had the type of personality where he's just so intense that if he could have, he would be glued to that video game. Um, and it'd be really hard to pry him away. 
but he found this little ball toy. It's called a perplexus. And it's something that if you turn it around, you could have the ball go through a series of different paths and you could if you were really careful you could keep it on the track it was actually very hard to do and so he would be just glued to that thing and people would try to talk to him and they couldn't even get his attention because he was so glued to it and some of the other kids were saying you know dad mom john paul seems addicted to that perplexus he seems addicted you you need to do something and so finally we're like well john paul we need the perplexus. And he was very upset. <laughs> and, but we took it away and, and didn't let him have it anymore. And just told him, you know, that was something which was not healthy for you. It was, it was stifling your um, uh, personality. Now, believe me, uh, perplexus is not a, is a fine toy. I, I, I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. It, it, it uh, uh, is something that I was happy to see in my house. Oh, this is fun. It could be be good but it was just in his case it was not a good thing in his case he was giving too much of himself into that thing and not continuing to be on this quest um living a life where he was really making decisions to seek uh the good so parenting this way when you really do Try to remove these things which are engrossing your children's personality rather than enabling them the opportunity to express it. It can become messy. Um, children get into all kinds of things. They, they dig holes in the backyard. They build tree forts. Um, we had our, a couple of our sons came to us. I think two of them were in high school at the time and one was in middle school. And they had this plan. They said, you know, Mom and dad, we would like to leave one day and ride our bikes from our house in Rockville, Maryland, along the CNO Canal to Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. And then we want to camp out on the Appalachian Trail that night and then ride our bikes home the next day. And it's about um, probably 50 miles uh, uh, one way trip. So it's a pretty substantial trip. And, uh, you know, we heard them out, what they wanted to do. And Angela looked at me and she said, this is your domain, not mine. You know, you need to take responsibility for this. Um, um, I'm, I'm too busy focusing on these other things. I'm not going to worry about this. You're the one that has to decide. So I said, okay. So I let them. Uh, and they went and, and they did it. They rode their bikes. They spent some time down in the old historic town of West Virginia, backtracked a little bit found a place where they could camp on the Appalachian Trail, camped there overnight, um, and came back the next day. And it was a great experience for them. Like you could tell that they had almost gone through this as a rite of passage, that they were more mature and more confident after having done this. Um, but this type of engagement in a way is, it's uncommon today. And uh, I think it's, it's uncommon because there's so many distractions that can get in the way of people living um, and expressing their personality in this way. Okay, so the final virtue that I wanted to talk about today is the virtue of chastity. And this is the virtue that helps someone to love properly with a heart that is ordered toward respecting the other as a person and refusing to reduce the other to an object, um, a mere object of use, something like a commodity to be consumed. It is a positive and life-giving virtue. Human love is noble. There is nothing wrong with this beautiful capacity for relationality that we have. I remembered of this uh, case where somebody came and challenged Pope St. John Paul II very strongly once. He said, uh, Holy Father, I don't understand the Catholic Church. I think this is an incredibly hypocritical institution, and I think you are very hypocritical. You talk about how pornography is bad, and there should not be pornography and, and all the rest of the stuff, but yet look around the Vatican. There's all these pictures of naked people throughout the Vatican. Um, I, I, I see pornography right on the walls of these churches. You know, how can you speak out against pornography and yet have all this, this stuff, this naked art in the Vatican? 
And St. John Paul II responded with just an amazingly wise response. He said, no, no. What's in the Vatican is not pornography. Pornography is not pornography because it shows too much. It's pornography because it shows too little. And you can hear in that response his call to never reduce a person to an object, but always to respect them. And much formation in this wonderful virtue of chastity happens naturally in a loving family. Children come to understand the meaning of God's plan for human love just by seeing their parents love each other and love them. If mom and dad love each other and, and they love me, then everything kind of makes sense. And they, they're very secure in that. Now, granted, it can be helpful when children are very young to name perhaps the virtue of modesty. Um, uh, you know, don't take off your shirt. You know, keep your shirt on. That's, that's modest. Um, you don't see dad walking around the house without a shirt on, you know, so um, we want to keep the shirt on. Or for a little girl, you know, keep the dress down. Um, don't go pulling it up like that. You want to be modest in that. Um, I think it's very helpful when children are very young for a husband and wife to tell the story about how they met, how they fell in love, um, how dad proposed to mom. It's funny, in our family, we have a slightly different version of that story. I will tell the story such that I surprised mom. She, she agrees with that. No one, that, that's not a disputed fact. But I surprised mom and got down on one knee and pulled out a ring and, and asked her if she would marry me. And I was so incredibly happy when she said yes, because I just know what a wonderful uh, person she is. And I wanted her very much to be the one woman I spent the rest of my life with and to uh, be the mother of my children. But she was so surprised that she fell over backwards and it was very good that there was a chair behind her. But then she'll always correct me. No, I knew there was a chair behind me. And the, the children, especially the little girls, they all think that's, that's great, that it's funny. Or they'll take mom's side. Yeah, dad, she knew there was a chair behind her. But in any case, the message comes across as the, you know, God's plan for the love between a man and a woman is good. It's something that's holy. Um, it's different growing up today than it was in, the time, in times past. And there, there does reach a time where I think that it is appropriate for us fathers to mentor our sons and for mothers to mentor our daughters, um, to give them sort of a heads up as to what is going on in the world around us a little bit, that we are really living through a time where there's a great battle in this area and to you know, sort of just reinforce what's good and what's true and to let them know that if they have any questions, they can come and they can ask us. I had been getting this advice from other wonderful families at the high school around the time that my oldest, Michael, was in fifth grade. And so finally I thought, okay, yeah, I really, I need to act on this advice. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what I need to do. So I went to Michael one day and I said, Michael, you know, this weekend on Saturday, I'd like for you and I to go out and spend some time together and talk about a few things. And um, maybe just in the morning, we'll go and do that. And Michael was like, okay, yeah, fine, Dad. That's great. What do you want to talk about? Uh, it's just, you know, things that fathers and sons should talk about at some point. And he was fine with that. And Saturday came around and we started driving. He was completely relaxed. I was not. <laughs> I was a bit nervous, but we, we got to uh, a place where there's a lot of trails that meander through a park, through the woods, very few people there. And, you know, I just uh, basically said, you know, Michael, I just wanted to let you know that um, God has an amazing plan for the love between a man and a woman. It's a beautiful plan. And it's something that's very much under attack today. This is one area where the devil in particular is doing a lot of damage in our society. And we need to be very strong. We need to stand up for that. And, you know, so I said some very general things uh, about this. You know, he's very young. He's only in fifth grade. I think it's important that we respect the innocence of our children. 
Um, keeping things in the proper context. You know, this is God's plan. This is uh, human love is a very, very good thing. Marriage is a good thing. It's holy. It's a sacrament. Um, I don't think we need to get into the mechanics when they're very young. Uh, mechanics are, you know, very re much related to just processes. But really, the truth here is so much greater. Uh, so I think it, I found it, it's enough to say that when a husband and wife come together, there is this wonderful marital embrace that they have and that God blesses that. Um, he can bless that with the children and that that's enough. Now, if they have questions, then answer them. Um, but otherwise, uh, uh, you know, no need to get into, into, uh, many details when they're, when they're very young. And Michael did have some questions for me. He had, you know, he's like, dad, uh, I've been hearing about this thing called, they call it gay marriage. And I just wonder, what is that about? And so I'm like, oh my, <laughs> okay. So I, I tried as best I could to explain it to him. And uh, again, just mentioning, being very upfront and honest with him, that we are living in a time when this is a great battle that is taking place. And we need to be strong in standing up for what's right, for God's plan for human love. And if you hear of any people that are saying things disrespectful about women or disrespectful about married love or disrespectful in these areas at all, you need to be strong and even go up to people and tell them that they're out of line. This is unacceptable. You know, you, you should not be talking this way. Now, you have to use prudence. There might be some situations where you don't walk up to that guy who's three times bigger than you and, and uh, you know, say that to him. Although maybe there are some when you do, but you have to use the virtue of prudence. But in any case, if it's not the right time to say something, at the very least, you need to leave. It would be wrong for you to stay when things are being discussed that are wrong and by you staying for somebody else to assume that you're okay with what's being said. You know, that would be a type of scandal that you could be giving. So, you know, so Michael got that. He, un he understood. And I kind of ended by saying, you know, and these are things that Michael, anytime you have questions, you come back and talk to me. I'll be happy to to answer any questions uh, uh, you have. Uh, but it's not your place to go teaching um, your peers or your younger brother, Thomas, who is only 16 months younger than you, um, any, of, any of this stuff. And, and Michael got it right away. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. So I'm like, okay, good. So then we get home and, and uh, Thomas, who was wondering, you know, what just happened? Dad took Michael out and he talked to him about something and I have no idea what it was and I'm incredibly curious to know. And so he came to Michael and Michael perhaps not so helpfully said, Thomas, I'm not going to tell you what dad told me. Dad will tell you when you're old enough. <laughs> and Thomas was not happy with that answer. He, um, he, uh, uh, was, you know, try, pestered Michael some more and couldn't get anywhere with Michael. So finally he came to me and he said, dad, what did you go and talk to Michael about? And Thomas was in fourth grade at the time. And I said, all right, Thomas, next weekend, you and I can go out and I'll tell you then. And so then I had my, my second first, uh, uh, father son talk the, the, the very next weekend and subsequently have talked with, with uh, many of my sons and try to touch base with them and, and just at least check to see if they have any questions on, on these matters. Um, if I haven't heard anything and I have no reason to suspect there's any problem, I mean, maybe once a year just uh, 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 to do that. Um, and I can, can't tell you how thankful I have been when I've had sons come back to me and say, dad, um, I, I had something I really need to talk to you about. I'm like, oh, okay, son, so, sure. And he'll, he'll mention something. And it's really something that's very simple. And, and I can put his mind at rest 
and let them know that it's not a big deal and just say, you know, thank you for coming to ask me about this. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'm so glad that he didn't do something like try to do a, a Google search to find whatever information he would find, um, but that he had the trust and confidence to come to me. That, that really meant a lot. Um, on the topic of pornography, this is a very serious problem in our culture for, for young people today. And I think that it's reasonable as parents, it, it's, it's reasonable for me as a father to assume that at some point in each one of my son's lives, he is going to encounter some type of pornography. It's so prevalent in the, the world around us that uh, it would perhaps be possible to, to go through all of his years growing up and never see an image, um, but uh, unlikely. And so I, I think to myself, how do I, I want to mentor my son so they know how to deal with this uh, when it happens? And one thing that comes to mind is this episode of the cartoon show, The Simpsons, where Bart Simpson, I mean, it's a cartoon, okay, but Bart Simpson sees an image, which is obviously a pornographic image, and Bart looks at it and says, oh, that's disgusting, but yet strangely compelling and attractive at the same time. And that almost, to me, sort of, in a way, is a good summary of what could happen if a young person comes across one of these images, they'll be repulsed, but yet at the same time, they'll feel complicated about it. They'll feel a certain strange attraction to it, like almost if it's so shocking that, that, that it's inviting that second look, that third look. And the, the right ascetical advice is not to enter into dialogue with this stuff. This stuff is 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 sticky the best thing to do is to completely turn away the brave thing to do in the face of this is to flee not to engage it um and so i mean i'm, I'm thinking through with my sons as they get a little older and they get approaching those middle school years you know what to to say about it and you know i'll, I'll make sure first of all they know what the word means what pornography means and, you know, I even mentioned that when you're in the grocery store checkout line, you'll see magazines that portray women in very bad ways, ways that could easily be considered to be pornography, but there's actually very much worse pornography that's out there. And, you know, they, they seem to know that. They, they've heard other people, you know, say that this is a problem. And, and thankfully, I've, I've had this conversation with them all before they've come directly in contact with it. Um, but I'll mention to them that if they're in a situation where, you know, maybe they're with friends, maybe on the playground or something, and somebody has a picture that is really, really bad like this, that, and they try to show it to you, what you should do is you should, you know, react very strongly and very violently at that point. Uh, reach out, grab that picture, crumple it up, tell the person in no uncertain terms, that is out of line. That is not the way that women should be portrayed. And you know it. You know, be strong about that. And, um, uh, you know, don't enter into dialogue with it, but there's a time for the knight to draw his sword. And uh, I was thinking about this more, and I really wanted to get this point across to my sons, because I think it is, is such an important point, that I came up with this crazy idea, and I'm not necessarily recommending that everyone do this, although you can, I think it's worth it to do it, but um, other people might say this is a little bit too much. But I, I would tell my sons, I didn't do this with my first ones, but rather with some of my middle sons I started, I would say, if you're on the playground with someone and they pull out a phone and on that phone there's an image that is clearly pornographic. I want you to reach out, grab that phone, 
throw it down on the ground, and then I want you to stomp on it to make sure that it is completely destroyed and smashed. And then you turn to that boy and you say, you have a problem with that, tell your dad to call my dad, and then walk away. And uh, <laughs> the reason this is a little bit scary is because I have one son, uh, Stephen, and, and when, when I did this for him, he got this big smile on his face. He was like, this is so cool. Dad is giving me permission to smash somebody's phone and I can't wait to get a chance to do it. Now, I've never actually had one of my sons do that yet. Um, and uh, I admit that I might get myself in trouble um, somewhat, but from my perspective, it's worth it because this is such a potentially harmful thing. And if we can get the message across to our children, that the right thing to do is to definitively reject this right from the beginning. And that um, I, as your father, I have your back. You know, I'm there. I'm supporting you 100% of the way on this. You don't have anything to be afraid of, okay? Because I, I, I know that you want to live a life committed to God's plan for human love, and I'm here to back you up completely. And so... Um, for, for what it's worth, that, that might be too much. Just, uh, I realized that I could keep talking on for a long time, but maybe wrap this up um, and shift to some questions. So just in conclusion, I don't think there are any easy processes or steps to raising children. Uh, parenting's not an easy job, it's, it's an adventure. Um, in times past, a lot of traditional parenting wisdom was naturally passed on from grandparents to parents in a way that was much more organic than than today. Uh, certainly, that still that still happens. I just think it's a bit more difficult today with our highly mobile and um, isolated lifestyles. Um, but it is possible to study and to reflect and to pray about how we parent and to try to inform our study by turning back to this wonderful tradition that we've inherited and search for wisdom in that tradition. Uh, I've benefited a lot from being part of a wonderful community here at the Heights and hearing many great pieces of advice over the years and seeing many heroic families. And it really has been my pleasure to try to put down a few of the things that I've learned from making my own mistakes and from hearing from other people into the books that I've written, that if they could just be another voice that parents are able to dialogue with, um, I think that, that they have done everything that I've asked that I could hope that I could hope for. So with that, I will stop and open up to questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Michael, for the great talk. And it's, this is a really hard way to deliver a talk as we as an audience aren't, you're not getting any of the energy from us, but you had me laughing and smiling. And so thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the great talk. And I'm just going to remind the group that if you could pose questions in the chat, it's too hard with a group this size to unmute people and have you um, ask your question yourself. So if you could pose questions in the chat, I will pass it on to Michael. Um, but I've got some great ones already from Jeff Mitchell, who gets the gold star for the evening. So one of the thoughtful questions Jeff asked was about the balance of freedom and structure. And I thought you, you spoke both about the virtue and the need for the virtue can only be exercised in freedom, but that structure is also really important. And yes. can you talk a little bit about how you navigate those two, those two different things? Sure. So um, order is a very important virtue and order does not mean an absence of mess around the house. So if, if our houses are not museums and with 11 children, uh, our house is going through various stages of being messy and being picked up and, and such. But, but order refers in a much more profound uh, and deep way to properly having our priorities straight. So God first, um, family second, professional life uh, of, uh, of, of myself, professional life uh, third. And um, in just a regular, in our, in our family, that there are times where the, the structure of family life is such that we join together for a meal. 
And after a meal, we do some chores and clean up. I mean, these types of structures built into the day are very good. That on Sunday evenings, after we do our cleanup, maybe we'll go on a little excursion, say a family rosary, do something. I mean, these, these patterns, these structures are very good. Um, I think it's appropriate, especially in this time of quarantine, for older children to encourage them to come up with a specific plan for their day where they think of the blocks of time that are available to them in the day and they schedule ahead of time how they're going to fill them, what goods they're going to try to pursue. That is structure, which they're sort of picking up from the way that, that your family life is being lived, but also they're, they're being encouraged to internalize that and to form a plan and hold themselves sort of somewhat accountable uh, uh, to that. So I think that chaos and structure can kind of exist together to a certain extent. And um, by focusing on sort of the big pieces and not trying always to micromanage the small pieces, you can leave a lot of room for the children to themselves, um, you know, exercise their energy, their freedom. And ultimately, uh, there's a difference between true virtue, which is something that is deeply part of one's character. It's a case where somebody carries their moral environment with them. This is what you very much want with a young adult who's going to be going off to college. College is kind of a crazy environment to begin with. Let's take a group of 18 to 22 year olds and give them 15 to 18 hours of structured class time a week and have them live in dorms with other 18 to 22 year olds away from the family. And hopefully it'll turn out well. I mean, it's kind of an, a crazy idea. Um, a lot of great things can happen at college and there are many very good, good colleges, but, but the need for that type of structure is, 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 is very uh, important. So to carry that moral environment with you is something that's only going to happen if somebody has authentic freedom and they've learned in a somewhat messy way to exercise those virtues and they've made mistakes and learned from those mistakes and it's real. Thank you, that was great. I love the advice of helping block out the big chunks of time but letting children fill in the blanks. That's great, thank you. Another really good question from Lisa here, um, which is if there's one practice or shared activity you could recommend that a family adopt to grow together in virtue, what would it be? You have to limit yourself to one, that's, that's tough. So the most important thing that a family can do together uh, would be to, um, to pray together, to go to mass, which at, least at this time would mean, you know, all gathering and trying to pray the mass through uh, streaming the best that we can, uh, praying the rosary, um, uh, that, that's the one example. The other thing that I would say just in general, uh, camping has been wonderful for our family going on these camping adventures. It's incredibly hard. It's, it's painful to do tent camping with all the children, but they treat it as such an incredible adventure. And the older ones fortunately do pitch in with the young, younger ones. And you get exhausted by you know, not sleeping as well some nights. Some nights you sleep okay. But uh, uh, that has, has really, uh, you can see that you appreciate your home so much more after you've spent a couple days out uh, camping. So I love it. That's great advice. We have a group of, a lot of groups of committed campers here at Holy Family. So um, we're, we're hitting that one. I love this question from John, and I, I wonder if <laughs> it's probably a little, a little subtext behind here, but um, he, they've got four boys, the oldest is seven, and he says, do you find yourself doing a lot of correction as you try to form them in virtuous behavior? And is there an age when you find this correction pays off? And maybe, maybe I'm reading into this, but maybe John is waiting for that, that payoff still to come. So, uh, yes, there's, the corrections are coming frequently, constantly, you know, whenever you're in uh, like I said, none of our families are perfect. There's bickering. There's people leaving stuff around. There's little corrections, big corrections that are that are taking place. Um, 
sometimes there's the best strategy is to separate certain children. Uh, other times it's to, you know, spend more time with, with one child for a particular reason. But, uh, as far as the corrections go, um, eventually they do pay off over time. They do. It's not this, this clear, easy, linear process by which you make a correction. And that's the only time you're going to make that correction. And then everything's going to be fine. Um, but to, uh, I, I think we as parents can look at our children and see them um, in, a, in a way, try to see them as God sees them, which means seeing them as even better than they are, um, better than they are apparently at this time, uh, that they have all these faults and those are, are, are very obvious but yet to see them with eyes that truly do love them and truly do believe that they, like all of us, are called to be saints, to be close friends of God. And that correction can be offered in that spirit. And it can be firm correction, but it's correction always because we have this authority that comes ultimately from God. And it is important that we exercise this authority well. And and we don't neglect our responsibilities here, but we can do it in a loving way. Um, you know, it's amazing, you know, how, how God treats our freedom with such respect that he would allow us to choose against him. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And that the mercy that's there um, to try to imitate that as a father, it's, it's very hard. Uh, Thank you for that answer. I'm going to go back to Jeff Mitchell's questions. Um, so here's one that I know I, my oldest is 11. So this is still in front of me. But the question was, this is very specific. At what age did you allow your children to start dating? And I think just maybe broadly your thoughts on, on dating. So um, as I'm talking with my sons, you know, one of the things that will come up will be uh, the possibility of marrying if that's your vocation and that, you know, talking with them about vocation, you know, you, you will be happiest if you find, if you follow the vocation that God has in mind for you. And so you should pray about um, what your vocation is. You should ask God to give you lights that can show you uh, the next step you're supposed to follow and gradually have more clarity as to what that vocation is. And if it's a vocation to marriage, that's an incredibly wonderful uh, vocation to holiness. Um, dating really uh, is oriented towards at least, there's different types of dating. So there could be dating in a group where a group of young, um, maybe high school boys and high school girls get together for a fun activity. Maybe it's something like ice skating. Maybe it's through some type of service work through uh, church. Uh, it, it could be coming over to somebody's home and playing board games in the evening as a group. So those types of, of, of relationships where there's not a personal one-on-one -on -one close personal attachment, they I think can be very healthy and very, very good for, for high schoolers and even better if, if parents are around and they could be part of that in a natural way uh, sometimes, even if it's only having it in someone's home. Um, but the type of dating in which a young, uh, a young adult who's a man, a young adult who's a woman, to, together form this close, intimate relationship, that has a certain teleology to it. That is, by its very nature, oriented towards um, a union which is ultimately going to be fulfilled in marriage or it's something that will fall apart and that can be a very painful thing. So my advice to them is when you're in high school, it doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense to want to get into that type of close personal relationship, close personal dating relationship, because there's going to be so many years 
before you are able to have that progress to to marriage, which is sort of what the human heart is ultimately longing for. Um, now, having said that, I do know of some people who have been able to keep a lot of distance from somebody, and yet they did sort of date through high school, college, and then actually were married. And I think that's difficult to do. Um, and in general would not be something that, that, that I would encourage. Now in college, it's a little different, but the advice I try to give my college age uh, children is if you're going to date someone, make sure that you're careful not to spend all your time with that person. On a college campus in particular, that can easily end up happening. You could be studying together constantly. You could be spending time together. Have other interests. Have other friends. You know, yes, spend time with her. Be, be you know, attentive to her. But, but also make sure that there's a certain amount of separation. Traditionally, these relationships between men and women were formed and also kind of blossomed in a community that included people of many different ages, parents, grandparents, other relatives. And that can be a lot harder on a college campus, the, the, the type of intimacy that can result in spending too much time together too quickly can be an unhealthy thing. So I know some parents who give hard and fast rules on this, this topic. You know, when you're in high school, you cannot date, you cannot date until this age and da 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 da. And, and I, I respect that. Um, and it may be in some families and I mean, families are, are, are different in certain uh, relationships are different and the way that parents are interacting with their children in different families are different. But in ours, I've, I've never done that. I've never had any of my children in high school uh, date in that way. They've, they've um, have friendships that of people of the opposite sex, but they're, things that are in a group and, and it's not any type of personal intimacy that they're, that they're focusing on, on, on developing. Uh, in, in college, I think personally it's best to at least wait and not date freshman year, <laughs> um, hold off at least that far. But again, you, you try to in, incur, you, you mentioned what the human heart is like, what its longings are for, and then count on their good prudence, um, encouraging them with some warm fatherly advice. That, that's the, 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 the way I've always approached it. Thank you. I love, or I, it's really a powerful idea to play out for your children that this is, this dating is, is meant to end in marriage and it help them to see how that could lead them to a lot of pain if, it's, if, it's too, if that's too far away. So thanks for that good advice. I've got one last question here, um, and, I, and the question's about working. So what's the balance of working a job in high school and college? Is that a good idea? And based on your comments earlier, I think you're gonna endorse the idea, but curious to hear what you have to say on that topic. Sure, yeah, getting a job could be a wonderful opportunity. Uh, it could even be a rite of passage of sorts for a young person to feel that they're making a contribution to society and to the world through some type of, of simple professional work. Now, obviously, you need to be prudent and not have it be something which is going to take up so much time that their primary responsibilities are um, neglected because they're spending too much time at this job that they're, that they're pursuing. Uh, but I think a lot of virtues um, can be learned through through a job, through work. Thank you. And I know in your in your book, um, Decisive Parenting, you talked about your experience with your helping your dad to load wood. So that was, and that was work you did at a very young age. Yeah, I think um, children today are 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 are. It's, it's unfortunate that we have so many time saving devices, and you almost have to be very creative to find good work for children to do, but they benefit a lot from being given responsibility and um, having things that they, that they can do to help the family. And they might not necessarily always agree with that at the time. There's certainly other 
things that they want to do at the time. But um, it certainly for me was the case that even though I didn't want to go out in the cold and help my dad um, when I was young, it was a very good thing for me to do it. Here's another question that I really like. Um, so the question is, how do you spend one on one time with your daughters? Um, it <laughs> seems to be easier with the boys. Excuse me. Yes, thank you for that. So I, I didn't get into this, but I think um, the role of a father and a daughter is like the, the wonderful, amazing, uh, easy role that is just so incredibly delightful. Um, so uh, my advice would be the type of conversations that I was describing me having with my sons. It is best if mom has similar conversations with uh, the daughters. But now, it, it, look, it, it, it's not always going to work out this way. There are many different complicated situations. And sometimes um, mothers are going to have to talk to sons and, and things like that. And, that, and, and you know, you, the best some can easily be the enemy of the good. You, you, you pray about it. You um, discern and, and do what's going to be the best for your individual situation. But uh, I think that, that fathers can have the wonderful role of, from time to time, taking out uh, one of their daughters individually just for a little treat. And what I will do is, you know, uh, try to treat my daughter like a little princess. She'll uh, come with me. You were going to the coffee shop to get a treat and to just do small talk. And as she's coming down to the car, I'll open the door for her, hold the door for her, uh, treat her like a princess. As we're driving towards the, the coffee shop, I'll ask her if she's comfortable, if she'd rather have the windows down or, you know, the heat or the air conditioning on, depending on the, on the weather. And um, when we get there, I ask her what she'd like, uh, sit down with her, talk to her about absolutely nothing in particular, just whatever's on her mind, making small talk, um, not trying to give her any particular lessons or anything like that, just uh, being attentive to her as a person and then come home and uh, uh, you know, thank her for going out. I had a very nice time spending time with you. Um, thanks for going out with me. And you know, she's all thankful to yo dad. No, that was great. Thanks. Thanks. And, but when a father does that for his daughter, he is, is basically making a wall of protection around her so that any boy, any man who will ultimately aspire to date her in the future, she will automatically judge that man according to the gentlemanly behavior that she's seen in her father. She will be asking herself constantly, is he, on those times when dad took me out, is this guy also attentive to me in the same way? And if he doesn't measure up, if he's not treating her like a gentleman, she'll, she'll know. And you are, are, are protecting her by doing that. This little eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old girl, just by doing that once in a while, you are, in a sense, um, helping her so much. So I think fathers uh, absolutely have the, the delightful and the wonderful uh, opportunity to spend some very simple time with their daughters and to uh, treat them as little princesses and um, treat them with a certain amount of refinement. And by doing that, they're really doing an awful lot of good uh, uh, for them. That, that does sound both, both helpful and, and, uh, and fun too. Yes. All right, here's, uh, maybe we'll wrap up with this question. Oop, uh, I lost it. Um, here's from the Emmels. With Having a large family, how do you balance giving your oldest children responsibilities um, and taking care of younger siblings and versus still letting them be kids? <laughs> sometimes not well, <laughs> sometimes better than others. So um, we, one of the things, like I mentioned in our house, there's various states of order and disorder. Um, one of the patterns that we found has been very helpful for us is after we have a meal together, which during this time of quarantine is usually, uh, it's often twice a day. So it would be after the noon meal and after the evening meal. Um, 
uh, we will do a time of chores together as a family and we'll divide up and our youngest Luke usually needs to be watched. So somebody will go and, and, and take him and everyone else will kind of have different things that they do and we work to get everything back to into order and then you know, it doesn't stay that way very long, but uh, um, so, so that's, that's helpful in that it's a defined time. And if there's other things that you need from the older children, it's helpful to try to give them a heads up and encourage them again to plan their day so that they're using their time well for the different things that they have going on. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, we often are, are blind to things and, and we don't, uh, you know, it's, it's really by having um, a life of prayer where you can reflect on these material and ordinary details of your family life, of your life, and, and talk about that with God that sometimes you end up realizing, you know, I really need to do something here a bit better. And maybe I'm burdening uh, this child too much by expecting too much for them in the wrong way, or this one is not getting the, the attention that they need in this way. And what practically can be done? Um, there's, no, there's no one uh, a formula, in a sense, that, that is, is the key to perfectly balancing this. And, and we certainly don't have a perfect balance um, we're constantly adjusting course and and trying to improve. So. Trying to find that golden mean. That takes a lot of work. Well, I want to wrap up by saying thank you to you, Michael. Um, you always, I know, I know from having read your books that you do a wonderful job balancing um, both the um, the really the philosophical underpinnings and the the big picture stuff, but also with really practical, concrete details. And that's tremendously helpful to me and, I, and I'm sure to the rest of our group. And I just, for the for the for those on the call, I wanna suggest um, if you enjoyed hearing from Michael, we still have copies of his book, Decisive Parenting, that you can pick up um, in the ch at the church. And then his other book, The Father and His Family is also excellent. And I know in particular in that book, he goes into some more detail on questions like dating. Um, I think Paul reads one spot, like a, a box of those books. And I know I've got a couple too. So if, if you if you need a copy, hit one of us up and we can lend you a copy. Otherwise they're well worth the small investment. Um, thanks so much, Michael. I got a ton out of this and I'm sure the rest of our group did. And it was so wonderful to see everybody's names and see some of the faces. And um, I hope everybody, hope to see everybody in a couple of weeks when Governor Waltz lives yeah. in the state. Hopefully, hopefully it won't be too much longer. Thank you so much, Nate. It was good to be able to spend some time with all of you, even uh, just through Zoom. <laughs> so. Thank you, Michael. Good night. Good night, everyone.